Perfect. So, hi. Uh, this is a joint project with Enriqueta, so please be polite. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I will not uh, take all the time. Um, we have some results, but uh, I think we really need uh, your opinion on this. So, in general, what we can say about uh, the basic model of electoral competition, starting from the Downsend model, is that if we have two candidates that really care about being elected, and if the space of alternatives is some kind of Euclidean space, one or more dimensions, and voters' preferences are represented by a distance between an ideal policy and the, the policy that the candidates propose, then the prediction of the analysis is that the electoral competition will produce moderate outcomes. I mean, in the standard model, we know that the two candidates class to the median voter, but we have probabilistic voting models that the candidates go towards the mean voter. Maybe they diverge in some valence dimension, but still they choose mixed strategies around the median voter. Maybe we have many dimensions in the policy space, and then again we know that in general a mixed strategy equilibrium will have uh, all the probability weight in the core of the policy space. So the main prediction always is that uh, electoral competition among candidates that really care about being elected leads to moderate political outcomes. But starting, this is the, the earliest paper that I found on, on extremism, uh, empirical literature seems to document uh, the opposite. Uh, thing that the electoral outcomes are not really moderate. What they, it, what they observe and what becomes more and more observed, and yesterday some speakers also mentioned it, is that, especially in American politics, you have a tendency of polarization between the candidates of the parties. Here, in this graph, they ask people to self-situate in a political issue, like to uh, declare their ideal policy, in a sense, in some economic issue, and to evaluate candidates. So all these dots that you see here are the mean evaluation of a candidate from voters that declare that their ideal policy is one, two, three, or seven. And we see that all the, let's say, the Democrats, the higher evaluation was from voters that are very leftist, and for the Republican candidate, that the highest evaluation is from voters that declare that are uh, very rightist in a sense. So this is an indication of a high degree of differentiation of the candidates, which goes against, let's say, the predictions of, of our standard model. So what it was proposed as an alternative theory to the economic theory of elections, the, the Dungeon approach to elections, was a, a model in which candidates still care to be elected, but voters want extreme policies. This is what is this directional theory of uh, voting. Uh, says that if, for example, my ideal policy is X, then this means that I value the left extreme more than the right extreme. And all voters behave like this, all voters care to have extreme policies. Well, this is something that we obviously don't like at all and that we don't agree that, I think all of us here, that voters behave like this. I mean that all voters, they all want extreme policies, but they evaluate different the extreme policies, but that they all want to have extreme policies. So to my, I mean there are other uh, approaches that predict differentiation, but this extremism is only predicted by this uh, directional voting theory. So what we have on one hand is our basic uh, model who assumes that voters have these proximity-based preferences, this is what we consider the, our rational voters, but predicts 
moderate outcomes which is in contrast to what is empirically observed. And on the other side, we have a theory that assumes something that we consider, I think, unacceptable in the sense that it doesn't conform with, with rational choice theory, but it predicts something that fits the data more than the traditional theory. So what we have is that there is an open puzzle because in, in reality we observe that <coughs> There is a high de degree of differentiation, a high degree of extremism, but our uh, theory cannot, uh, cannot predict that. So there are some uh, new papers that, uh, that also predict some kind of extremism. The first paper, the, the logic behind the result is that parties have some strong supporters and they want to uh, receive funding uh, from them, so they are keen of uh, supporting some kind of uh, extreme ideology so that the, their extreme supporters are satisfied and they fund them. And another paper more related to our approach is that you have voters that are uninformed, that they do not know what is the policy that uh, the candidates choose, and this uh, lack of information induces some kind of extremist behavior. Now, the only I mean, the main issue with this paper is that it has only two available policies, so we cannot really distinguish between extremism and uh, simple differentiation, which occurs in other environments as well. So what we will do is actually take the, the standard Dunshan model. We have just uh, uh, one political issue. We have... Uh, a unique dimension, two politicians, that, uh, two candidates that just pick uh, a policy. Voters have standard single-picked uh, preferences, and uh, we assume that candidates do not know exactly the ideal policy of the median voter. From now on, just consider that there is a unique voter. This median voter is the unique relevant voter. So we're in the standard setup. And the only thing that we do is that we switch the informational structure. We assume that voters cannot see the actual policies that the candidates choose, but they can only perceive their relative positioning. I mean, we see two candidates, and what we know is that one has uh, chosen a policy that is more leftist, than the other candidate. This is the whole information that we have. Here let me uh, argue that this is not, uh, let's say, a surreal <coughs> assumption compared to the standard assumption of, let's say, perfect information, because in uh, empirical literature we have a whole bunch of researchers that try to estimate the political platforms of candidates and the existence of such literature indicates that these, their political platforms are, are not obvious since we are looking to, to find them. And moreover, in many surveys where we try to measure the level of political awareness of societies, there are questions of the form, which of the two parties you think is more conservative in this issue, which is something very similar to an information structure. But again, in that uh, setup, in, that, in these questions, we don't have a consensus in the answers from the societies. Maybe just 60 or 70 percent agree that somebody is more conservative, and the other 30 or 20 percent, they have the opposite opinion. So it's not really a very bad information setup. It's limited, it's incomplete information, but for, for as reality is concerned, it's not such a bad information setup. So otherwise, everything is the same. The voters observe this three possible information sets, L, I, and R. L means that candidate A is, has offered a more leftist platform. I, it means that they both gave the same, they both chose the same policy. And R means that candidate A is more rightist. So then voters vote, and payoffs are realized. Our equilibrium concept is the perfect Bayesian equilibrium, but our main result qualifies stronger equilibrium concepts such as sequential equilibrium. So let me just show you briefly 
the game. Candidates choose strategies. We allow them to choose pure or mixed strategies. They, we do not make them choose a pure strategy. Then, before the voters observe one of these three information sets or one of these three uh, signals, if they have chosen a pure strategy, we go directly to this next stage. If they chose a mixed strategy, then a policy is selected from the probability distribution that they defined. Now I'm going to tell you. So we analyze uh, various uh, setups. As uh, let me start first with your question. So we have, a, as I told you, unidimensional policy space. So we consider two different setups. In the first one, we have a, a continuum zero one, and the second one, which is the setup I'm going to speak more in this presentation, is a discrete subset of uh, of zero one of any conditional locations, okay? Now, the other uh, split that we do in the analysis is that we consider first that candidates are identical, let's say, in the valence dimension, that uh, the only relevant thing for voters is the, the policies that they offer. And the second one, the second environment, is that we consider that A enjoys a minimal valence advantage, that is, the voter always cares for the policy, always votes for the candidate that believes that, uh, that this, uh, this voter, uh, will, that this candidate will give a higher utility to the voter, but if the voter is indifferent between the policies of the two candidates, then the voter would always vote for candidate A. So let me first briefly describe what happens in the case of uh, candidates of equal valence. The game produces uh, multiple equilibria. This is something that we expect because we take a, a game with perfect information and we throw away a, uh, a lot of uh, useful information. In reality, this setup is almost identical to McKelvey and uh, Ordershook, but with the main difference that they uh, make a, uh, a number of behavioral assumptions on top of the assumptions that we have here, so they refine the result, they get rid of some of the equilibria. So let me now explain what we find there. We find equilibria, I mean, any pair of, any strategy profile in which both candidates choose the same policy can be an equilibrium, we can find beliefs that can support this strategy profile as an equilibrium, but the most, let's say, common uh, outcome is this extremist outcome where both the candidates choose or both the left extreme or the right extreme. Uh, also, we have equilibria in which they locate symmetrically around the expected position of, of the median voter. The reason is the following. When the candidates have to choose their policies, they have to have in mind what will be the possible reaction of the voter to this election. So the voter's choice depends on the voter's preferences and on the voter's beliefs of what the candidates chose and, of course, on the information set that is the information that the voter receives. So the candidates know that the voter will behave taking account all these, these three different elements, and these three elements can simply translate in an election probability for each candidate for its information set. So the candidate A knows that if I'm in information set L, if I appear to be more leftist, then I should expect an election probability of 60%, let's say. So in all uh, setups in, in, in all taking account all different combinations of beliefs and preferences that produce this kind of expectations that are different than 50% for each information set, then they converge to one extreme. Only in cases where both candidates believe that they have 50% probability in all three information sets, only in, three, in these cases we can have convergence in some other point rather than extremes or divergence around the median 
voter. But still, we believe that given the multiplicity of predictions, the prediction of extremism, even if it's the most common outcome here, it's not strong enough. So let's go to the minimal advantage case. We're in the same environment. I repeat, the only difference is that the voter votes for the candidate that believes that will give the higher utility, but in case the expected utility from both candidates is identical, this, candidate, this voter doesn't split the vote, always votes for candidate A. Now, this seemingly small addition in the model uh, changes the, the results very much, and we practically have a unique equilibrium outcome. This equilibrium, when the number of locations tend, goes to, to infinity, when we have a very rich policy space, this equilibrium uh, converges to maximum differentiation. Let us see why. Okay, I mean, you don't have to really follow the, the, the slides. Assume that the candidates, when they have to, to choose their policies, as I said, they expect some kind of reaction from the voter to their, to their choices. So assume that what they expect is not something that we can argue yet that it is a part of the whole equilibrium of the game, but assume that what they expect is a symmetric treatment. By symmetric treatment, I mean that they both... Uh, believe that the candidate that will appear, the more leftist candidate, will be elected with probability Z, independently of which candidate is this more leftist, and the candidate that will appear to be more rightist will be elected with probability 1 minus Z. Assume that this is what they believe. And of course, if they coincide, they know that candidate A will be elected with probability 1 since it has this minimal advantage. Then what we can prove is that given this expected treatment, the candidates in this uh, sub-game, there is a unique mixed strategy equilibrium which has full support in the policy space. And here we have uh, two examples with six locations and with 12 locations. The reason is the following. Ah, also, we have assumed that this Z is higher than one half, that is that the probability of election, if I appear to be more leftist, is, is higher than one half. So let's assume that the red dots represent the probability density function of the mixed strategy of the advantage candidate and the blue ones of the disadvantaged candidate. So as I said, for both of them, it's better to appear that they are more leftist. So why does the disadvantaged candidate choose this kind of, uh, of strategy? Because as the advantaged candidate moves to the right, the probability that the advantaged candidate will appear to be the, the leftist one reduces. But at the same time, since the density of the disadvantaged candidate increases, the probability that the advantaged candidate coincides with a disadvantaged candidate increases. And this kind of strategy induces the advantaged candidate to be indifferent among any of these policies. So the opposite reasoning justifies the, the decreasing slope of the, of the PDF of the mixed strategy of the advantaged candidate. And as I tell you, what we observe is first that it is unique, that there is no other equilibrium in this subgame. And the second very useful observation is that these two mixed strategies are actually like mirror. They're like symmetric around one half, which will be crucial for, for, for the next part of our proof. Now, as we see, as the number of locations increases, we can show that the weight that the advantage candidate puts uh, epsilon far from zero converges to one and the weight that the disadvantage pulls epsilon away from one converges to one as well. So practically, even though we have a completely mixed equilibrium technically, in reality, we converge to a pure strategy profile that is zero and one. So we, we now use the, this property of the mixed strategies that they are like mirror strategies that are symmetric. This fact that they are 
symmetric around one half, it does not depend on, on z, on what they believe is the probability that they will be elected if they are the leftist one. It depends just on the fact that it is symmetric. So what would a voter do? Let me for, forget this slide. What would a voter do in this case? A voter with an ideal policy that is smaller than one half of the, of the policy space, okay, would vote for the candidate that appears to be leftist, since they are symmetric, independently of the information set that we are, either we are in the information set L or R. A, a voter that has an ideal policy higher than one half would vote for the candidate that appears to be rightist. So what is the probability that the leftist candidate is elected is the probability that the voter has an ideal policy smaller than one half. So what is the only reasonable value of z, the only reasonable uh, beliefs that the candidates have about what will be their probability if they appear to be the leftist candidate, is the probability that the voter is on the left side. So this is the let's say, the equilibrium of the whole game, which is also a, a sequential equilibrium, and I think it maybe qualifies other equilibrium concepts, because normally people don't like very much mixed strategy equilibria, but in this setup of incomplete information in particular, when you have mixed strategy equilibria with, uh, that are completely mixed, I mean, they have support over all the uh, policy space, then beliefs have to be consistent in its information set. And this is what the, re the main reason why I presented you the results that we have for the discrete case, as opposed to the continuous case, the continuous policy space, because there, the disadvantaged candidate in this setup of minimal valence, it has the, this disadvantaged candidate has the option of completely avoiding the information set I, to, to appear the same as the advantaged candidate. And therefore, we cannot have equilibria in completely mixed strategies. So beliefs of the equilibrium path can be any beliefs. But here, we have this outcome. Now, still, this is not an argument that it's the unique equilibrium of the game. But what we can show is that, I mean, since we have we proved that there exists an equilibrium with this property. We don't have any issues about existence and understanding how an equilibrium in the game works. But what we can show is that if another equilibrium exists, then it also should converge to maximum differentiation. So I think that it is an issue of showing that I believe that it is unique, this equilibrium. But there is an issue of proving whether it is unique or not. But even if we don't manage to show whether it is unique, knowing that if something else exists, it converges to, to this, I mean, the substantial uh, interpretation remains the same. So about the continuous policy space, what I can say is the following. We can show existence of equilibria that lead to this maximum differentiation as well. It's not that changing this technical part of the, pay, of the, of the model uh, rules out this kind of equilibria. No, the opposite. This kind of equilibria exists in all uh, different setups. The only difference is that we have more equilibria for the reason that I mentioned. Because now in the continuous policy space, the disadvantaged candidate can avoid, by a continuous mixed strategy, uh, arriving to information set I. So we don't so we have equilibria which are not in completely mixed strategies, and therefore we have various beliefs that can justify this kind of uh, strategies. Now, some things more about the robustness of the game. Uh, even if we have assumed that voters not only know the direction of the two platforms, but we allow them to know the intensity of differentiation. For example, we don't have just three signals, L signals, three information sets, L, I, and R. We know that we can tell the voter, listen, uh, the candidate A is more leftist than candidate B, and their distance is, I don't know, three locations, four locations, 0 
even with this kind of information, we can show that the equilibrium that we presented is an equilibrium of this extension of the game. I don't know if it's the unique, but it, it qualifies as an equilibrium even for this extension of the game. And something else that we try now is to allow the possibility of having both informed voters in the traditional sense that we perceive it, voters that can see the policies, and uninformed uh, voters, as are the voters in the setup that I presented. We have results for, for three locations. It's very difficult, I don't know, to characterize the equilibrium for n locations or for the continuous case when we allow both informed and uninformed. But with three locations, <coughs> we have results for any symmetric distributions and for mildly asymmetric distributions. Here is just an example of the uniform case. So consider the following variation. The candidates know there is a probability V with which the voter will be informed. With probability V, the unique voter will see what are the specific policies that the candidate chose, and with probability 1 minus V, the voter will just see the direction, as, a, as a, we presented before. So in this case, if we define the degree of extremism of the equilibrium as the probability that no candidate offers the moderate policy, so we have three policies, 0, 1, half, and 1, so if, I mean, there are other ways to define the extremism of the equilibrium, but they all lead to the same conclusion. What we see is the following. When V equals zero, this is something I didn't mention before. When the probability uh, distribution of the median voter is completely symmetric, when the expected position of the median voter is exactly one half, then it, this is the only case where the mixed strategy equilibrium I defined before is a uniform mixture for both candidates. In all other cases, if the expected position of the median voter is slightly smaller than one half or slightly uh, bigger than one half, then we get this complete extremism. So for V equals zero, that is the probability that the voter is informed is zero, then both candidates mix uniformly. If the probability is 1, then we are in uh, Enriquetas and Tom's uh, setup where the advantage plays uh, with higher probability in, uh, in the moderate policy. But in any case, if we compute the probability that no uh, candidate chooses the, the moderate policy, we see that it is uh, decreasing in, uh, in V. The, the higher the probability that the voter is informed, the less uh, probable, no, the higher the probability that the voter is informed, the more probable that we will have a moderate political outcome. If the probability that voter is uninformed, then higher the probability that we will have an extremist outcome. So what we how to be the contribution of this work is that the economic theory of democracy, if we, de if we perceive it as, it's, uh, as, it, as it started, that we have office-motivated candidates and that voters care for the policy to be as close as possible to their uh, ideology, can produce equilibria that are not convergent. Uh, only if we play a bit with uh, the information structure and uh, also, we can show that information is very relevant for good political outcomes in democracies because there is an idea that we economists have that doesn't matter so much the level of information. Things get uh, aggregated uh, very easily. We always go to the, to the good outcomes independently of the, of the quality of information that each of us holds, but uh, this this need not have a, a global application, so we believe that uh, with better informed voters you have more convergent equilibria, better outcomes for the societies, so information is relevant and may be responsible for this polarization that it is observed, that gradually people are you know, less informed and outcomes become more polarized. 
So you were too polite. <laughs> I have a question too. Yes. So, could you think about, I mean, is, is the logic uh, work if you think of something like uh, they have like this direction preference and then there is some kind of area in the center in which uh, the voters, the there's a set of policy that has pretty much the same. Okay, so you mean that there is like a distance, uh, that is, there is, I mean, if the policies are nearer than... They are uh, the same. They're all the same to me, yeah, but this is exactly what this discrete uh, policy space is doing. So this is, this is exactly the idea, because we were thinking exactly what you say to apply to the continuous case, and this is what it does, but it needs more formal structure to do this. But this is exactly the idea. If we perceive that a policy is, as, I mean the voters, we perceive that the policy is identical if it's closer than 0.01, this is exactly the effect that it's created. The disadvantage wants not to coincide in this region now and cannot avoid not to coincide by playing a continuous mixed strategy. Plays a continuous mixed strategy, then again the advantage candidate might, might mix uniformly and there is positive probability of coincidence then. So what you say uh, is captured by the discreteness, let's say, of the, the discrete cases. How much depends your result on the uh, symmetry of the voters' preferences? So you, I think you assume symmetry. The preferences, the, they are symmetric, but not. Oh no 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 not at all no no the, we do not assume uh, symmetric distribution, and as I told you, the symmetric distribution is the cutting uh, result, in which the both candidates uh, mix uniformly. Here, uh, in the beginning, the first assumption is that uh, the probability uh, mass in uh, all the points lower than one half is bigger than one half, here in this first example that I show you. So, Generically, if we assume that generically is that it's asymmetric, the distribution of the median voter, generically we have complete maximum differentiation, something that tends to maximum differentiation. If we have symmetric distribution, then they both mix uniformly. It's, the differentiation is of high degree again, but not like absolute differentiation. So this is, this is come back to Andrea's question, not super well formulated, but... Um, Another version of, the, of his question is, I think, suppose you had better observability, like your extension where I can observe sort of some information about distance, right? but the valence is bigger. So the valence, right, it, that's sort of equivalent to, to, the, to the world in which he, and so then there's a question about, there's a question, you can think of it as, as whether the extremism is, is only comes in this limited case, or you can think about it as an entirely static question, what happens to <coughs> the extremism Okay. As the advantage gets bigger. What I, what I can say about this is the following. Now the trick here, and w the trick, the, what is very useful to have smoothly the result is this symmetry of the, of the distributions, okay? So if we start basically on the same assumptions and we assume a higher valence, then these mixed strategies will not be symmetric to each other. Then to derive conditions on what is like the, the equilibrium the, of the whole game will be more complicated. But for the, for example, for the continuous case, first of all, here with the discrete case, we have existence uh, guarantee that there exists a perfect Bayesian equilibrium. So we can show again that it leads to, to differentiation. But this fact that the, the distributions are not symmetric complicates our approach. I do not believe that it changes substantially the, the result that in equilibrium we will have something else than a high degree of differentiation. But uh, the answer to my question might be similar in the sense that doing this analytically and getting out of the space that you have to do it in the very coarse policy space. 
Yes. Right. So if you make a finder, um, does does V map? If you make this finder, does it still get your No, well, I haven't tried. This is just something that. Uh, I'm wondering if that's sort of. I mean, because you've got this really strong result, which basically is with a fair amount of voter uncertainty, so they only know directions. Um, you, get, you get all the way to the extreme, you get boundaries, essentially. Yes. When the policy space is zero. And um, the question is is that robust? Is that result robust to adding? More information. Uh, I mean, the, the three locations example, I think it shows the direction that probably by giving more uh, uh, probability to the case that the voter is informed will draw more probability weight from both distributions around the, like the expected median. But uh, there are, I mean, the, what we do by allowing the voter to be informed with probability is to introduce another force, like a centripetal force that we have removed. So you, you suggest that maybe... That's a question. Will that centripetal force persist? I think the transition will be smooth because as in the example of the three locations, I don't have any reason to believe that in three locations there is a smooth transition. There is a, a smooth transition here from the extreme outcome to the moderate outcome by increasing this probability. So why sh this shouldn't be the case for more locations? I don't know. You think there is some reason that we should expect something else? Well, I think it's, yeah, I, I don't, I, I guess I don't, can't scratch anything in the With the three locations case, it's really simple. Imagine. Well, I understand how that works, but okay. I don't see how that intuition would necessarily extrapolate to essentially. Well, with many locations, consider that, let's say, with 50 50 probability, the voters uh, will be informed or not. So if I believe that appearing leftist to the uninformed voter is the most profitable, out profitable outcome. And uh, I'm situated in the, in the left side, then by going to the, to the right side of the spectrum, my probability that I appear a leftist decreases. On the other side, as I approach the expected position of the median voter, I increase my re-election probability in case the voter is informed. So there are, there are again, these both, both forces. So the one does not cancel the other once we allow them both to, to exist. Okay, well, the main way to prove that is to introduce an epsilon chance in the other model. Say, so what happens if there's a very small chance? That they are informed. Okay. I guess I'm going to ask the second stage class of questions. I don't know if you can read it, but it's certainly correct what you said at the end. That information aggregation is actually the atypical case, it's not the natural. I mean, the fact that it ever happens at all is in fact pretty remarkable um, in these things. But in the case where it does happen, it's in this kind of direction. Like the distribution of simple discrepancies, lay special. And so I guess I was thinking about what happens if you have at least some proportion of the population. Uh, is known to be, we don't know who it is, we know that there are some informed people. And because that exactly fits, as far as I can tell, that fits into the person who has to do aggregation model. And that says that if every you know, behavior condition is not critical, they will get almost fully the correct outcome, which will bring, bring them back to, um, to a lot of questions I have in this sense. And so I guess the question is the robustness of that. How, how robust is this? The fact that no, it's, it's common knowledge that nobody knows the short of the cancer. It's one different extreme, but it is an extreme. And the candidates know that there's a few bits of it. There's somebody out there. Yes, but uh, 
No, uh, this argument is about the strategic uh, considerations that, uh, I mean, maybe it's more probable that I'm pivotal if uh, what they chose is close enough, rather, if it's very asymmetric. It's a question about it. You're using the asymmetry in critical ways, which is the extremes, right? And, and, um, and you've ruled out the information Indeed, because we consider. Assuming nobody, you know, that nobody knows anything that's on knowledge, so except for candidates. No, no. As a result, there's nothing that gets faster. I think your point, if I can translate it here, is not the fact that we rule out the possibility that they are informed, because here what we do is we allow them the possibility that. Yeah, there's only a chance. There's a probability that someone. Exactly. It is. It is the one voter analysis that uh, we perform. I think this is your criticism is yeah, there. Yeah, but that you can do that if you, if you would vote out any interesting. So I, I can turn it around. I assume the one voting is precisely because you know any vote down the floor, so it doesn't matter. There's nothing aggregated on it when you use the way, so it's not a measure of the Indeed. But this is the way that you can correct If we had many voters and some were informed and some were uninformed. If we assume sincere voting, this would be the case. If we assumed yeah. that yeah. they take account, uh, vote, we would have a, another kind of analysis. But uh, no, no, no I'm, I'm just trying to put it in the context. I think this is what you said. That's fine. But you're the one who wants it to be rational and frustrated. So you can't have it. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's cheat. Okay, but in the main part of the model that we present, it fits. You're right. right. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.